So good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the fourth webinar of our project Start. Uh, we are Utopian. We are in an association, uh, a nonprofit body based in Rome. And we, um, our main uh, focus is the digital transformation, the innovation, but not, not only from a technical standpoint, of course, but also from a social standpoint, from a political standpoint. Uh, we aim at, to the, 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 the start project, we aim at reaching a very wide audience. Uh, we want to involve um, citizens, uh, public bodies, uh, universities, research bodies. Um, we want to involve all uh, kinds of stakeholders because we want, because we want to, um, to find a way to start again after the pandemic. And also we want to try to, uh, to try and uh, to transform this, uh, this, this um, event into something um, into an occasion, into something that will uh, allow us to, um, to become in some way better than we are than we were before the pandemic. Maybe this is a very yes <laughs> difficult goal to attain to reach, but anyway, we are trying to do that. Uh, so tonight we have um, Paul van der Broek. Uh, he will talk about um, how technology can empower us. Uh, this is a very wide topic. Thank you, Paul, for being, for being here tonight. Uh, the webinar will be coordinated, moderated by Luisa Scarter. So, Paul and Luisa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here, by the way. Thank you, Roberto, for the introduction and good, every, good evening, everyone, also from my side. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight with you and discuss this very important topic. So the topic of today's webinar is technological empowerment. And as Roberto already anticipated, we are very lucky and honored to have um, Paul to talk about this topic with us today. Paul, thank you very much. Um, just um, a short um, introduction to today's speaker. Paul studied history and sociology in the Netherlands, in France, in the United States. After an international career as an executive in human resources management, he's now executive coach specialized in leadership development. He's also teaching at Louis Business School and at the University of Lausanne. Thank you once again, Paul. And before I give you the floor, um, some quick instructions to the participants. Uh, so um, today's session will be recorded as the as the previous webinars. Um, you can uh, participate in in various ways. So you can use the chat, but if you want to participate um, in a more live way, so by turning on your camera and your mic, let us know through the chat, and we will make sure that you and you can participate also in this modality. Um, please uh, feel free to ask any questions and comment on uh, on poll presentation through the presentation. So um, don't wait till the end. If you have an upcoming question, just feel free to ask. It's going to be a very interactive webinar. And so we are looking forward also to, um, to your inputs and, uh, and ideas and comments. So this is all from my side. Paul, thank you once again. And I'm looking forward to, to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Luisa. Thank you, uh, Roberta, for uh, your introduction. I'm very pleased uh, to be here tonight. And uh, what I want to, to do uh, tonight is uh, to share with you some, uh, some observations I've been having during this time, time of the, the COVID crisis, which has had a lot of consequences uh, on the number of things, but also in, in the way we, we participate in organizations as, as employees and members of organizations, um, and also in the way we participate as citizens uh, in our political systems. And uh, uh, what I want to do today is not, not offer you uh, uh, a lot of answers. Uh, perhaps we'll have some answers at the end of this webinar, but I particularly would like to share, as I said, some observations with you and uh, uh, share some questions. Uh, what I've been observer, observing in organizations where 
as you've heard from the introduction from, from Louisa, I'm, I'm most active, but also in um, the, what I've seen and personally experienced as a citizen uh, are some things which, which are quite different from before the crisis. And on the one hand, they concern me, uh, some of those observations, and the other hand, some of those observations give me hope for uh, what is coming uh, after this crisis. And I, and I share very much um, uh, what Roberto said about that. Uh, uh, we should try to learn from what's happening now and make sure that we come better out of this crisis, uh, take it as an opportunity for a, a better world, better organizations afterwards. Um, so what, as we said, we'll do a bit interaction. So I also will involve you um, uh, with your own experiences uh, during this webinar. And we'll start first with focusing on, on organizations. Uh, and the time permitting, I'll depend a bit on, on, on your questions and, and, and comments. Uh, we will also touch upon what I see happening in, in political systems. So um, it's a, today it's about the relationship between empowerment and technology. Huh? The question is, does technology make us uh, more empowered in organizations and, and perhaps also in political decision? Or uh, actually, does this hem us in? Does it reduce uh, our freedom, our empowerment? And that's what, what we want to talk about today. But let's first talk about what, what is empowerment or what is empowerment in, in my definition. So let me start with, uh, with sharing a, a, a slide with you. Um, Louisa, if you could allow me to share a slide or if you want to do it for me, just so that uh, you're on mute. Yes, I need to, to ask Roberto if we can do that. Yeah, I so you need to either give me access or share the... Yeah, yeah, but I think you should be able to, but I am trying, okay, okay. Just a sec, uh, panelist, yes. I think you should be able to share your screen. Yes. Okay, there we are. Okay, so empowerment. Um, for me, empowerment particularly is a matter of boundaries. Huh? So as a person, as an individual, um, uh, you are empowered if you can set, maintain, and protect your boundaries. And um, we've, we've recently, if you talk, just talk about political system here, we've recently seen that, that people within Europe, for example, are concerned about that, and as it has an impact on, on, on some election results, um, that people are concerned of whether within their country they really can still uh, protect and set their boundaries uh, within Europe, but also outside. And so it's something which is important to us as individuals. And um, therefore, if empowerment is a matter of boundaries, then you can increase empowerment or reduce empowerment by shifting and crossing boundaries. And let me explain that um, uh, in the way that goes in, in organizations. Now, we should bear in mind that organizations, uh, whether it's a, a, a private company or a government organization or an NGO, these are not democratic organizations. But even so, within those organizations, uh, individuals that are part, that are members of the organization have more or less power, decision-making power, um, can more or less set their own boundaries in the sense of how they do their work, where they do their work, and the decisions they take. So um, for me, when I look at organization, there are three essential boundaries of empowerment, uh, which is to do with task, time, and territory. Let's uh, go through those one-on-one. -on -one. So, when you talk about task or decisions, what is it that you do and to what extent are you empowered uh, to, to uh, decide on your task yourself? Or to what extent do you have to let others uh, have uh, a say about uh, what you do? Um, there, for example, you have, um, um, if you look at organizations, you can have the following situation. You are 
an organization which has a, a company which has a sales organization and you have sales representatives in different regions of a country or even in the world. Now before technology came into play, these sales managers which were out there in this territory, well they had their own little kingdom, they were very empowered of what they could do with, with regard to selling client relationships and so forth. Now, now that technology has come into play, things like email and mobile phones um, and so forth, that had an impact on that empowerment. On the one hand, perhaps in certain situations, it, it increased the boundary of empowerment because the sales manager now had much more and much quicker access to information which a person can use to vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the client relationship. But also, uh, it can decrease empowerment because um, it makes it much more easier for the boss who sits uh, in the headquarters to call up by mobile phone, by email, uh, their sales manager and have an influence uh, of what that person was doing. Another example, for example, you know, uh, probably the, the Red Cross who was all over the world in, in war zones, dealing with, with uh, prisoners of war and otherwise. Now there are two, um, uh, in, before technology came into play, these people were doing those missions in these several uh, uh, countries. They could decide themselves how to solve a problem with regard to uh, 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 hostile situations and, and how, to what extent, prisoners of war were dealt with according to the Geneva Conventions or not. Nowadays, with technology, there's much more a link up to the headquarters in Geneva where there is discussion uh, on what is there to do. And knowing some of these people who have worked for a long time for the Red Cross myself, I know that some of them regret the old days when they could decide on themselves. And now they've always have somebody with perhaps a different and probably more political view um, deciding on their task uh, in, in wherever they are in the world. Huh? So there's, that's one boundary around task. The other boundary is, is around time. Um, now, Thanks to technology, time boundaries um, are less important. You can be part of a global team uh, which works in different time zones, where everybody works on the same project and when somebody is finished in the evening, then in another part of the world, the morning starts and you can continue uh, with, with that, uh, that product. Um, but the other hand, yeah, now that um, you can send uh, emails everywhere, um, you know, when you wake up in the morning, there may be an email uh, waiting from your boss um, who um, who tells you what to do and that's an, an infringement of your empowerment. Same thing that your boss can call you up anytime now uh, on a Saturday evening or send an email which um, makes it difficult to separate the time when you work and the cyber time when you do your private things. During now in uh, the crisis and COVID, lots of Zoom conference, another conference like we are doing now. And what you see that there's an increase in companies buying software which allows them to check what their employees are doing, what websites they are uh, looking at, to what extent they actually do work on their computer when they're at home. Uh, and that, of course, reduces uh, empowerment. Then territory has to do with where do you do your work? Huh? There used to be a time when you went to the office or the factory, that's where you did your work. And when, when you left, then um, you, you were outside of work and there was a clear boundary between where work happened and where work didn't happen. Now, with working from home and technology allowing that, that boundary becomes blurred. It's much less clear about where is work and where is private. Um, and it has also effect on that you now people can look into your home now uh, and you give a different impression than when you are in, in your office and there's an impact on how uh, uh, people see you. On the other hand, uh, you see smart people now are using that as an opportunity to increase their empowerment by making sure that they present a specific image they want others to see of them when they are working from home. Uh, you can do all kinds of things with the background. Huh? Are you going to show, show a lot of books to give an intellectual impression? Or are you going to show a nice 
um, modern Scandinavian interior to give you a bit more innovative uh, brand vis-a-vis uh, -vis your colleagues uh, and your boss. And so it also here it goes both ways. And then an interesting thing which is happening now um, with regard to territory and boundaries is we are doing this Zoom meeting now and suppose that we are a, a team in a company now all of a sudden we have the same size box from which we are working whereas in an office the boss may have a bigger office than you do and uh, different um, territories indicate also uh, different levels of empowerment whereas in such a conference there's a more of a level playing field so boundaries that shift um, there's opportunities for increased empowerment thanks to technology but at the same time there's also opportunities for uh, the empowerment to to go down um, now let's look at those two things empowerment and technology so here's a, what i call an empowerment continuum so on the one hand you have the area of free freedom of the member of the organization huh? if you're fully to the right you're fully empowered, you can decide on everything um, you want. Um, you don't need to ask for permission to anyone. Um, on the other hand, you have an increased use of authority by the organization, uh, where on the total left you have an autocratic situation, you have nothing to say. Your boss tells you exactly what and when and how to do it. And between that, you have more other types of leadership styles, so to see, more consultative, where you're ask for your opinion, but your boss decides, or participative, where it's more of a team decision uh, of what happens. And uh, we'll come back to this uh, continuum uh, in a moment. Another continuum is the technology. Huh? So, and essentially, yeah, most of the technology we're, we're talking about now and using, whether it's mobile phones, uh, video conferencing, emails, uh, and so forth, uh, Google Drives, where we put our data. Um, they, the more we use that, the less we are close to people. Huh? So with technology, we can reduce the physical proximity. And in the COVID crisis, that has been very important uh, for our health and safety. And so we've been using a lot of technology to reduce that physical proximity or social or physical distancing, as we have been calling it. And um, now that's also the case in the workplace. So if, if you look at some, some examples, so if you look totally on the right, uh, where you have uh, uh, complete physical proximity and 0% virtual, that's for example, the nurse in a hospital. Uh, the nurse has to go to the hospital to do, uh, uh, to do the work. There's no, uh, there's little opportunity to do that virtually, particularly not if, if, you, if you're working on intensive care, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and in the middle, let's say 50% virtual, that was often the case before the crisis for university students, where you go partly to classes where you have a physical contact with your fellow students and, and with, with the, the professor that's teaching you. But for the rest, you are working uh, from home, um, uh, with an online library where you got your, your data uh, and, and articles online with, with which you were working. And then on the other side, fully virtual, um, we see that uh, now still, for example, with uh, teachers uh, in, in countries where the schools are still closed. Uh, um, uh, pupils are taught uh, at home, the teacher is at home, and it's 100% virtual teaching. And in the crisis, huh, and that's a development we've seen, where we've seen the nurse still doing the same work, uh, uh, going to a particular place uh, with physical proximity to the work, whereas teachers, huh, to take the example, they shifted from more or less 0% virtual, uh, working um, almost full time with, uh, uh, with children in the classroom, to completely to the other side of 100% virtual. So let's take a moment. And let's now have a look at your personal experience. So what I would like you to do, uh, and let's, let's, um, let's go analog this time. Uh, and that means that uh, if you have a pen and a piece of paper, then that's probably the easiest thing to do. Uh, but if you want to do it in digital way, by all means, 
So what I would like to do you do first of all is to look at uh, this first continuum. Huh? So the 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 empowerment um, uh, continuum, the blue one, dark blue one. Um, when the left the um, the area of freedom you have, and on the left, the use of authority by the organization. Now think just back to the time before uh, this virus, this COVID crisis started. So let's take January or perhaps February this year before it all started, before the lockdown. Um, and if you were working at that time, then think, then plot, so put a, a dot or a cross there where you think you were, were on this empowerment continuum huh? were you more on uh, did you have more freedom or were you was it more on the left side where the organization decided what you had to do and the same if you um yeah you are uh, you were a student at that time right? for, for example at the university has a similar thing where you have more or less freedom uh, to to um, decide um, what you do so plot yourself on the area where you think uh, you were so when you have that then look at the 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 continuum below the more green blue one on my screen which is technology continuum uh, which goes for physical proximity on the right to use of technology again thinking back at that time before the crisis started january february um where were you then when you were working or studying where would you plot yourself with, with regard to uh, physical proximity and use of technology? Were you not virtual ta on, so like the nurse, or were you more in the middle, um, where you were a combination of physical work or studying as well as virtual and using technology? So, got that? Now, what I would like you to do is to go back to um, the top continuum and put another cross or put a circle to make it the different clear. Where are you now or where are you just before the lock? Where were you, let's say, a few weeks ago, just before the lockdown ended? Huh? Were you more to the left of your original position in January or more to the right with regard to your level of empowerment and you know how it works now so the fourth thing i like you to do is to put a circle on where you are just or where you were just before the lockdown with regard to uh, the continuum the technology continuum with regard to virtual work physical proximity versus use of technology so, and what I'm interested to know, and that's why I say I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to your uh, ex experience, um, is to, to get some experiences um, from you with regard to um, where you are or where, where your movement has been. So let's ask, um, and I don't know whether you can, um, raise your hand in some way or write it in the chat uh, so what's the best way of doing it I'm looking at Louisa here but what I'd like to know first to hear from those of you who um, have have seen um, a shift of larger empowerment so who've seen the empowerment increase during this period of um, uh, of crisis uh, in the organization or the or the, the, the school or university you're part of, uh, have you seen a sh shift in empowerment, which has become greater thanks to, in this case, uh, more virtual work, the use of technology? I haven't seen any difference. I work as a researcher. Yes. I used to work part-time, oh well, partly from home, partly from the office. Now is um, full-time from home but I don't see any difference. Okay, so you feel you have to make the same level of decision-making opportunity and decide what you do. Yeah, okay. the type of activity, as you mentioned, based on the sector, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Somebody else who has, has seen their 
empowerment increase, huh? so become bigger thanks to virtual work and use of technology during these past few months. Well, my case, in my case, for example, uh, I, I think that, uh, that now, uh, well, as my working on technology in general can uh, allow um, to um, manage more than one, uh, more than a single uh, job. So this gives you more power, of course because you can um, negotiate different conditions, mm -hmm. better Absolutely. conditions than before. In, and uh, being involved yes. in, in more than one job or different. Yeah, exactly. You can, yeah. yes, you yeah. can become, yes, you, you can get involved in more and more jobs and you can manage them in more scalable way, I would say. Right. So this it's more scalable. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What about somebody who has experienced their empowerment go down? And so because of the use of technology, more virtual work, has seen that they have less empowerment, less freedom of movement in their work or in their studies, um, less decision-making opportunity. Well, in my case, for example, um, what happened is that I was to work as a researcher, but at the university, I was forced to be there physically for, for like a certain amount of hours, even if it's a job that I could eventually do from home. Uh, and so this has been a change. Uh, but on the other hand, what I've seen from other, um, since I have more projects, um, they have less issues in putting like uh, meetings on Saturdays, on Sundays, in the evenings. Uh, and so this is, was something that um, before the lockdown, I mean, you, the weekend was the weekend. So you could work, of course, on your own, but you didn't have meetings. Um, well, now, yeah, this is something that is happening uh, more often. So what, what you've seen is that, that, that let's say, Whereas before you had an official work day, so week of five days, as it's only the case. Now that became blurred with weekend and actually had not only just because you want to do informal meetings, but actually officially work related. Um, yeah, not from my university of, uh, at the moment, but with other projects with uh, people yeah. in both different countries, it, um, it happened this yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a clear example indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the things that is difficult to uh, to maintain those boundaries when it's not visual anymore, and actually you know need to go go someplace. Um, that makes it more difficult. Yeah. Anybody else has an example of of how their empowerment has changed during the crisis as a relation to working more virtually? Um, so there is an answer from the from the chat. Um, yes. I will read it now. So both happened. I was able to manage my task from home, which was great. But on the other hand, it was quite difficult to separate my private life from my work life. In my company, we started to have daily briefings where we discussed our future task and evaluated the task from the past. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, so you have indeed. And that, of course, also happens. At the on one hand, you have more empowerment and the other hand, less empowerment. Uh, so uh, the, the clear example of people f being happy of not being forced because they have to, uh, which is a way a, a reduced empowerment where somebody makes you go somewhere and you have to go to the office every day because that's where the work happens, but that you don't need to do it anymore, but can do it from home. That is an increased opportunity of, of, of decision-making and you don't need to go uh, in that, that bus or in that car every morning. But at the same time, then yeah, the difficulty with separating private uh, and, and, and personal life um, and uh, yeah that, that is a feeling of less power indeed of things happening to you as opposed to you deciding what's happening to you. Do we have another example? Okay, any uh, questions or comments on what I've been saying about empowerment um, boundaries 
as it happens in organizations. Somebody not agreeing with what I've been saying, I mean, after all, this is also up for debate. Okay. Um, well, if that's not the case, then uh, let's talk about political systems, shall we? Do we really need boundaries, says uh, Roberto. Um, well, I think to make an organization work, if we say on that topic, um, in my experience, I think boundaries um, are helpful. Why are they helpful? It makes it easier to, to distribute tasks, tasks to get people to, for everybody to know what to do. It avoids inefficiencies like overlap, huh? people doing the same thing where, where, um, where one person would suffer. But on the other hand, there should not be too strict uh, because uh, if you have uh, too strict uh, horizontal boundaries, then it makes it difficult for people to, to uh, cooperate and particularly it makes it difficult for people to learn um, horizontally. Um, if you have too strict uh, vertical boundaries, then it makes it difficult for people to progress in organizations and also for people uh, for bottom-up innovation uh, to to come to come to the top. I mean, there have been many examples of where uh, managers have been deaf to what's been coming up from the organization, and that was not particularly good for the success of an organization. So, I think, yeah, I think boundaries are helpful. Uh, boundaries, it's also helpful if boundaries are clear, but clear boundaries is something else than um, fixed boundaries. You can have both with boundaries which are clear and what's clear is what the difference is between the left or the right side or the top or the bottom of the boundary. Yet at the same time, they are flexible in the sense that they can move depending on the needs and the situation. Does that answer your question, Roberto? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, thank but you. I do have a follow-up kind of questions on that. Go ahead, Louisa. And it's on, on who is best suited to set the boundaries and which type of boundaries are we talking about? Because of course we have seen like in, in labor laws with the development of technology also a role, a more, uh, the um, wish for a more involved legislator, for example, the right to disconnect these discussions about the need to, to set the, the boundaries also of the working private yeah. life. Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to, to ask you, because I have a background in law, so I wanted to ask you from, from your perspective, so from your organizational um, leadership perspective, um, how, how do you feel like um, in this crisis, what changing, who set the boundary? If we have already, like, an, if the boundary set by the legislators are enough, or if organizations come up with other solutions or, or other type of boundaries? Mm. Well, I think that, 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 that a certain framework of, of boundaries set by example, by, by law um, is helpful, but um, we've also seen that um, uh, too many or too strict boundaries. And, and, uh, and uh, if you look at, for example, the labor market in Italy, uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, and what I've seen in organizations is that, that um, and as is also outside of organizations, you, are, you may have a law, but then you have a situation which is very subjective. And it is, then you start interpreting to find a solution. And the law never gives you a precise solution. You always have to interpret because there are different individuals, different situations, different contexts, different interests involved. So in that respect, to leave things as much um, to uh, the organization and the members in that organization, I think is, is helpful. What is necessary, however, is that there is then empowerment, that there is an opportunity for that exchange um, and for people to, to, to have that decision-making power to an extent um, uh, on what they do and in the organization. That doesn't mean doing away with hierarchy, but nevertheless um, having uh, uh, an open exchange and empowerment. And that's my point 
actually um, overall, I think it's it's important. Uh, it's it's really important for organizations to develop their members at all levels in the organizations, uh, because development is is uh, the key key condition for empowerment to happen. All right. Shall we look at political systems then? So um, now, when we think about technology um, and empowerment political systems, uh, and, and then when we start thinking about disempowerment, uh, so the lack of empowerment or reducing empowerment, then um, yeah, we are, I guess, all a bit familiar with this. Um, if those of you who have read uh, 1984, um, no doubt remember the big screen through which Big Big Brother uh, is watching you. And uh, but nowadays in China, uh, we see um, individual citizens getting credits or de debits depending on their behavior, and that the behavior is being controlled by traffic lights, which are being which are fitted with a camera which uh, allows for face recognition. Yeah. So that's, um, for me, that's a clear example of disempowerment. And um, what is interesting, and I think also a bit concerning, is that during this, this COVID crisis, we've seen that some of these technological, technological devices, which thus far we only knew uh, to be used in authoritarian systems, they all of a sudden they pop up in our democratic societies uh, and being used to to um, to to fight the pandemic, if you will. And we see now, like in China, we see flying drones over beaches, uh, which can look at people's behavior and tell them off um, if, for some reason, they are not sticking to the rules. And over the past, let's say, 20 years or so, we've seen uh, quite a few examples of the impact of uh, technology in, um, in political system, particularly also in, in, let's say, in revolutionary movements. Um, if we go back to, to about 2004, 2005, we had the, the orange uh, revolution in Ukraine, uh, which, which toppled um, an autocratic regime. And the internet uh, played a major role in the mobilization uh, of the citizens that, that uh, made that revolution uh, come about. Then a few years later, we've seen the Arab Spring, where social media and the use of mobile phones were very important in mobilizing people. On the other hand, we've seen that also too, that let's say the adversaries, the, the regimes, were able to use those same technology uh, to, to suppress those revolutionary moments movements. In Hong Kong, we've seen also uh, the use of phones and social media in, in very creative ways by, by uh, the people who, uh, the demonstrators against uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, autocracy. Um, and there, well, we have to wait and see uh, what, what the outcome will be, uh, who, will, who will make best use of those technologies to, uh, to, uh, to, to get the upper hand. But also in, in, the, in the, the election campaign of, of uh, President Obama, we've seen for the first time uh, the use of, of technology, particularly uh, social media and also algorithms to, to calculate where would be the most support to able, able to target uh, the, the investment in, in, in election um, publicity to those groups and to the media these groups uh, um, were, were reading or seeing. And then, of course, after that came tech, Cambridge Technology Partners, who with the whole misuse of Facebook data uh, for, for political purposes. Uh, so we've seen a lot happening already before the crisis with regard to technology and the impact on, on political systems. So um, let's have a look um, how boundaries function in uh, uh, political assistance, and particularly then in, in democracies. There we go. 
Thanks. So um, here's a, a schematic overview of what I call citizen empowerment. So essentially, as, as citizens, we have uh, we are involved in, in in three circles. There's the, the circle of control, uh, where we can fully decide on and control what we do, what we think, what we say, where we go, um, and so on and so forth. Then there is around that a circle of influence, uh, where we have a say, but not a full say, where we can influence what is happening. Um, and then outside that, there is a circle of concern, things uh, which have a certain importance to us, and uh, what's happening there is important to us, but we don't really have a way as citizens to influence that. And here we have um, particularly two boundaries which are important for empowerment. On the one hand, the circle of control, does that circle become bigger or smaller, and depending on which we are more or less empowered in, a, in the political system we are part of. And then also the boundary with regard to the, the circle of inference, does that become bigger or smaller. Hmm? And, and let's look at some examples to, to, to clarify it. So, you know, circle of control is really our freedom of movement. Huh? We can go anywhere where we like. Huh? We can take, uh, we go on foot or take a, a vehicle. Uh, we can travel around the country. We can go into a shop, into a restaurant, in, into, into a cinema, into a school, uh, and so on and so forth. Huh? And that's, of course, something which has clearly been an example of where that boundary has been reduced during the lo lockdown in a substantial way. Then the circle of influence is, is voting in our democratic societies. Huh? We, we, uh, what happens, uh, the, the government that governs us does not only depend on my vote, but of the vote of others as well, but my vote does have an impact and influence on what government uh, um, I'm, I'm ruled by. And in the circle of concern, for example, is, a, is debate in the parliament. Huh? It's something which I cannot influence. And, and in some countries, um, there's also a law against that, huh? that parliament should be able to, to debate without any, any uh, infringement or influence from the outside. Huh? But what is discussed there, of course, is important to me. It is of my concern. Um, so, and let's now have a look what has been happening recently or during this COVID crisis with regard to um, the circles of uh, control, influence, and, and concern, and particularly with regard to, to uh, the boundaries, how they have moved. Hmm? And that's then the next uh, slide. Um, so what I've seen, and these are just some examples, huh? it's absolutely not complete, and I'm interested to, know, to hear some of your examples, um, is that what we've seen is that some things, and, and, and I'm talking now particularly about the influence of technology, um, some influence have been empowering, and others have been disempowering huh? in the crisis, but also before. Huh? So if we look at what we've seen um, uh, with regard to empowering, then uh, Rousseau, huh, the, 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 the website uh, or the internet technology introduced by, by Cinque Stelle in Italy to have more involvement uh, of citizens huh, is in, in a way why the circle of influence has been enlarged, where there can be a, a large influence of uh, the population by referenda or opinion polls onto the process what was before in the circle of concern where the government on their own debated and decided. Uh, the same thing for social media. We've seen in, 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 in the influence of, of social media where people share their opinion, but I'll be asked for the opinion um, that is being uh, used. And an interesting example in that regard from the crisis is in the Netherlands, where it has become very clear that the government has purposefully leaked information before they took any decision with regard to, to uh, the virus lockdown or not lockdown and going fast and going small and how to do it, that they leaked some of that information so that it became part of social media, people discussing, and depending on what sort of what we see in dispersion, what people thought 
on, the government decided more in this way or more in that way. Yeah? So there's a clear interweight the circle of influence was increased by using social media. Another example, which is already from before the crisis, is the Convention Citoyenne in France, which uh, President Macron has introduced to, 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 to create a citizen parliament to talk about specific measures for uh, climate change. And I'm mentioning it here because these meetings of citizens are taking place in an analog way, in the sense they actually meet, at least before the crisis they did and discuss. Um, but technology was being used to, to come up with a representative sample of 150 citizens, taking all kinds of things into account, education, sex, um, um, age, and so on and so forth. And technology was used by getting a representative sample from phone numbers that was the, the source. Um, then I think WikiLeaks is also a, um, an example where technology has increased a circle of influence because of some information was there which we can give our opinion on and which had certainly influenced the political process and decision making. Circle of control, I think e-commerce is an example where your span of control or your, your circle of control is increased because you can uh, now much more decide on what you buy and what you don't buy and how you pay and so forth. And then in the crisis, the, the tracing app is an example which has increased the circle of control because it allows you to decide where I go and where I don't know, depending on where it's safe for me or where there are more or less patients or people with, who have the virus or not. Disempowerment on the other hand, if you start with circle of control, uh, as I mentioned before, face recognition is clearly something which reduces your, your circle of influences because it sort of locks you in in your, your behavior and has consequences to be used in China at least for uh, later things like buying a house, for example. Algorithms that, that are being used uh, to influence uh, political decision, uh, political opinion making is something where you can say that may disempower us. And then in the, in, in the virus, geolocalization, where we use phone data to see where there are a lot of people or not, uh, where, um, and to what extent they are sticking to the rules of social distancing or not. I think that also is something which reduces our uh, circle of influence. Then especially on the drones who tell you where to go and what to no go, I think is reduces our control. On the other hand, the tracing app, which gives you control of knowing where to go, at the same time, it also reduces the span of control, but it reduces um, and can uh, yeah, also influence other people's behavior towards you. And then, yeah, where before we could just go to any shop we liked, now somebody is counting and tells us whether we are allowed in or not, which is, uh, in my, from my point of view, um, reduces the circle of control in a sense that gives you less empowerment of the site where you go and where not to go. So these are some observations where I think there are some positives and some negatives, also already things from, from before the crisis. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, what you think about that, your questions, uh, and, and also perhaps some personal experience where you've seen your, your, your circle of influence or circle of uh, control being expanded or reduced uh, in, in as part of being a political, as part of being a citizen in the political system. So we have two questions in the chats, and I will follow the order. And and then, okay. So the first one um, is um, so Mario would be interesting to hear your views on digital automation of uh, yes human agency empowerment especially as software and machine systems become increasingly autonomous and capable? Yeah, so um, it's a question about artificial intelligence, which is part of that, that question too, and, and, and is an extremely important question. So, um, yeah, in, in that respect, it, it, it has its positive cons. An example, um, in the Netherlands, um, when there are elections for the past few years, the, uh, an application has become quite popular, which is called um, the um, the voting indicator. Um, and what it does is it does it, it it's a bot, 
and you ask that bot uh, online um, it gives you statements or the bot asks you questions about what do you think about healthcare or where should the government spend more money on all those kind of things and what's behind there is all the election programs of the political parties and based on that the system asks you questions they say yes no this that and so forth and from that comes a, a conclusion sort of a ranking of political parties who are more or less close to what you think and you can base your voting behavior on that so i think on the one hand i think it, it's very empowering uh, because it gives you access to a lot of information in an efficient way which otherwise perhaps may be difficult to access because you would have to le read all the political programs and so forth and um that um that that may not everybody may do that on the other hand there's also a risky side to it in the sense of okay so who makes up these questions based on what uh, because even if you have this source of uh, parts of political programs you can still depending on how you construct the algorithm behind there uh, it may have an influence uh, so i think it's um um, artificial intelligence can have fantastic um, uh, opportunities for us, but it, but there are two things I think are very important. One hand, to have a controlled system of what's behind there and what the potential biases are uh, in in that that system, and on the other hand, I think it's very important that um, people are continuously educated and developed to be able to deal with those systems and ask the critical questions that are needed and realizing that you're not talking to a real person um, and perhaps not even with an objective system but with a system which has been put together by subjective human beings he has a follow question and um it is how through which institution should um both existing and still to be created should these systems be governed, assuming that they will run on platforms with, um, with a reach way beyond individual countries and even continents? Um, today, these emerging systems are under the effective control of private corporations. Yeah. Um, now, I think there is, there, there is a, um, there are some examples. Of, uh, so, I mean, you can, you can think, of course, of a government um, system uh, or, or intra-government system which controls that uh, um, but then you're talking about uh, things like the united nations and frankly from my perspective um, from what i've seen over the past few years that has not prevented uh, things happening from a perspective of political biases or from interests between countries so I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of whether such an intergovernmental agency would bring that the objectivity uh, and the wisdom we were looking for. So the alternative for me is, is private competition. And uh, I think as long as we have laws going against uh, um, companies getting too big a market share, uh, and, and we have to, there are some things which are concerning with regard to Amazon, for example, and so forth. I think that that's very important but as long as we have that i think we can put some faith in in private competition um and cooperation for that matter huh? because there is there is uh, an, an an organization in silicon valley which decides on what emojis are being used huh? and you can apply so for example uh the breweries in the world they we came together say we want the beer uh, uh, a beer glass a glass of beer as an emoji being used in iphones and so forth so they apply to that agency and say would you please allow this emoji of a glass of beer uh, in 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 your systems huh? um, and they cover all the systems they cover apple android and so on so the whole work and so and that's a cooperation between a number of big companies and you know by and large i think that's working well huh? i mean you can argue whether they should have accepted an, an energy earlier or later or not at all but uh, it seems to be uh, getting fairly representative huh? so from my perspective i think on the one hand laws against um, uh, oligopolies huh? so um, companies who have too big a market share but at the same time allowing 
the private marking to decide it for itself. So I'll continue reading the questions that are coming and then I will uh, ask mine. Um, so Julia is asking, in Italy, we have experienced the creation of test course groups composed by experts in a certain field, giving impartial scientific opinions based on data. The government has taken its decision mainly based on opinion given by these expert groups. Is this a form of indirect institute disempowerment? Could it be seen as a form to limit the discretion of the government? Yeah, it's a fantastic, fantastic exa uh, uh, example because we have seen that in all countries, these expert groups. Huh? And what have we seen in many countries, and Italy is only one of them, but it was also the case in the UK, uh, in the Netherlands uh, and Germany, that this group of experts, they were all interdisciplinary. Yeah? So you had virologists and, and economists and psychologists and uh, you name it, but all men. So you have to ask yourself, is that a rep to your question, is that representative uh, of, of citizen empowerment? No, because it's not a representative uh, group. Certain groups, women in this case, were insufficiently uh, represented. And you see them, that also then in, in, um, in um, biased decisions. So in Germany, the expert group, that is big panel, uh, of, of all men deciding on the, uh, the, the end of the lockdown and what should happen when and so forth and so forth. And took all kinds of managers of companies and, and hospitals and social distancing and so forth. But at the very end, the, the, the last thing they did is to open childcare facilities. Yeah? Whereas we know that young children are hardly it, uh, at risk with regard to the virus, but it was just on the assumption that, well, there's somebody going to take care of these young children anyway. There must be somebody, uh, most likely a mother at home, who takes care of them while we do everything else. So it's not important to open childcare facilities uh, earlier than, say, uh, restaurants. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an example where I think these expert panels is a good thing, but therefore, I would like to come back to the example said earlier of the, the Convention Citoyenne in France. Um, that's a very interesting example where they really did their best to, to get 150 people who are representative of the French population as it is it now, and have them talk about specific um, topics, so not just the whole thing, but come up with ideas for, um, like this group of experts, of what France should do with regard to um, uh, climate change and bring up and the attentions that these proposals are being brought as they are in, in Parliament or in a referendum so that the whole democratic system can go on it. Thank you, Paul. So while um, maybe we receive, um, there are other questions coming in the chat. Yeah, I... Let me just as a follow up on these sure. two examples, huh, these expert panels. Uh, and the crisis and this uh, Convention Citoyen in France. The difference is that these expert panels were decided on in an analog way. So who should we take? Oh, this one, I know this one. Who do you th who think, oh yeah, we should really have a virologist. Oh, I know this one, yeah? So a list of names and choose from them. Whereas the French uh, chose those 150 people using technology. Huh? going by phone numbers and thereby coming up with a representative song. So, um, yeah, I had this um, question comment, which is also like not too far from uh, from one of your last comments on, on Julia's question. And um, it's when you were referring to, to mothers and experts. Uh, and uh, my question is on the digital divide and the um, infrastructure, because as long as I'm working in the, in the factory, in the industry, I have the, the infrastructure provided by my, my employer. Once when I'm home, um, it might be that my connection is not good enough and I'm not paid well enough to have a better connection. Um, and with schools, with um, kids, we also have seen that, um, well, this is, a, this is an important matter because if I don't have the facilities, meaning the connection in, in the case of, of those or the devices, we might not have enough devices in, in our house, then um, 
my right to education is being is being uh, yeah uh, undermined. And um, in that case, also in these in this task force or group these groups, um, there were no representatives of these um, people that are more affected by the digital device. So um, how to come up with those? We have the technologies, but they have these um, shortcomings. Uh, I think it, 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 uh, it, it's a serious risk you're pointing to, um, and um, um, it was already there and happening before the crisis happening, huh? because what we're seeing is that, that whereas before we had, we had a, a difference between rich and poor, now it's, we're more and more getting a, a difference between educated and not educated um, in, in, all, all, in, in many countries of the world and certainly also in, in Europe. And that was already happened and the crisis i think that's if anything a positive thing that this crisis happened that made this very very clear exactly with the examples you mentioned of people not having enough connection to home and there being a difference in the organization between people who have it and have not them an indication between families who have a computer and, and, and digital access and those uh, who don't um, and the consequences of that means. So I think what I would hope is that 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 um, uh, and to come to so what Roberto said in the beginning is that now that it has become very clear because the clients is that we use this opportunity to invest in that. And now there's a lot of money becoming available to deal with the consequences of the crisis, and particularly economic consequences. And I think rather than and that's my personal opinion, rather than uh, spending billions of euros in in trying to get airplanes to fly again, I think we're much more for the long term, much more very visual to invest in that to make sure that all countries have uh, a good digital infrastructure with good digital access that are that are programs for for everybody for school children so forth to have uh, a good technological system to 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 access the education. Um, in, my, in my view, the, the biggest risk is that of inequality. So the digital gaps would be, we, we will see them widening yes. in, the next, in the next few months, or even in the next years, in the uh, coming years. So we should uh, use all, all, all that money, because there is money, but anyway, we we hope so in order to uh, yes in, in order to reduce inequality so uh, in terms of access to, the, to technology but also access to education yeah in order to use technology yeah and you know and and we've seen that 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 um, digital education i mean i've seen that also with my my own children my daughter is at university and my son is at, at high school so we had different over the past few months that was di digital education in, in, in different ways. Um, you know, it, it's going quite well at the end of the day. Yeah. So I mean, uh, and that means that we have an opportunity also to 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 uh, democratize education, to get age education to places where before uh, uh, we didn't get it to. Right? It, I think it's. Perhaps at the end of the day, it's easier to get education into the homes of people than to get the children from the homes uh, into the schools. Um, and that's perhaps something where, where, um, where we can work with. And, and it doesn't need to cost that much money because the, the, cri the, the, the virus crisis costs a lot of money. But it's not a digital education that, that, uh, that was the biggest, uh, biggest cost. Far from it. Okay, I think there are no more questions. Uh, I don't know if Luisa would like to add something. No, I was very interesting. We're very happy to have the opportunity to, um, to have you here um, for this webinar. Thank you so much for once again. And, My pleasure. And yes, so, we <laughs> please go. <laughs> No, and, and of course, also for the participants, we are organizing other webinars in the future, so um, feel free to, to join. Yes, we will have uh, another webinar on next Monday with Lina Zeruli and coordinated by Luisa again. So 
<laughs> so feel free to join. Uh, thank you, Paul, for being here. Uh, hi. I hope we will have another, maybe a, a few months, another webinar again, you know, there to, yes, to, to a, a little follow up on that. And yeah, to, uh, to, I enjoyed yes. it very much. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, everybody, for your questions and comments. Bye.